Today I'm going to talk mostly about uh, some of the practical uh, lessons that we have encountered in trying to build this platform uh, using the advances, advancements in AI. A quick background, uh, I have been working in the field of big data and AI, uh, fortunately with uh, some of the best uh, industry and academia leaders, uh, mostly in the applications of behavioral ad targeting, recommendation systems, you know, click-through rate predictions, and uh, semantic representation of uh, knowledge for robotics. And uh, I've been with Meltwater for uh, almost three years now. Uh, a brief overview uh, for, for, uh, for, for the folks who don't know. We are a, a truly global partner in the space of media intelligence. Uh, we, we have more than 60 offices across the world, and we sell our product to more than 30,000 uh, uh, companies uh, globally. And we are, uh, you know, we are pretty much bootstrapped with no venture funding uh, in mid-2000s. Our core mission ever since we started our company is, uh, you know, it's been almost two decades. Uh, even though the type of the data that we have been analyzing, the core mission is always to enable forward-looking decisions based on the insights that we can main, mine from external data. Traditionally, we started with news. This is even before the concept of social data didn't exist. And over the time, we added a lot more data types, like, uh, again, uh, all the social, job postings, advertising, Right, and our uh, our value thesis is uh, there is a lot of online breadcrumbs that is out there, and if we systematically mine it, there is a lot of interesting uh, insights that can be found for decision makers. Right, and uh, you know, uh, examples can be online news to financial filings, web traffic, advertising, app downloads, trademarks, product reviews, consumer confidence, etc. This is an ongoing list for us. Uh, even though we first started with the news that served us for almost eight years before we had to add any other data type. But now our, most of our innovation is in terms of uh, trying to add more data type and trying to extract knowledge from it. So outside insight is the sort of the tagline for our company. Uh, so we leverage AI and uh, ML technologies to derive insights from uh, all the external data. Uh, this is sort of the different uh, offerings that we have. Everything from uh, cadence to reports to responses to the media like crisis management to real-time alerting on the events and predictive signals that help us understand uh, the growth and uh, the risk of a company or a brand. Who is being used? I mean, you know, there are several uh, personas, as we call it. We have uh, customers who are uh, actual investors, investor relations, corporate strategy, PR, corporate communications, marketing, product development teams, and sales leaders. Uh, all of them are built on top of the same platform. They get a slightly different view based on the workflow they're trying to optimize for. Yeah, as like our CEO would like to call it, we have customers from Pope to Coke, <laughs> leveraging our product in some or other fashion. Yeah, <clears throat> why do we need AI? Why do we need AI to make sense of the external data, right? Uh, as most of you know, the external data is very unstructured. So we need a lot of data mining techniques to you know, structure it and also find some interesting patterns. Uh, it mostly comes in the form of text. That's the, that's the medium that we are going after from an external data perspective. So we need a ton of natural language processing techniques. It comes in many languages and many shapes, right? Like for example, news is a long form document. A tweet can be a very short form. A patent is uh, well, much more... Uh, uh, structure with technical terms, it comes in a lot of shapes, so we need uh, a way to do domain adaptation. And also, you know, we have uh, more than like 80 languages uh, in terms of the data that we bring in, and we cannot build a model from scratch for each and everything. The data can be very deceitful, you guys know this. It's, uh, there is a lot of uh, contradictory data or wrong data that is out there, so we need a way to extract this knowledge in a very factual way. We need to assign confidence to everything that we mine. It can be really d difficult to connect the dots. If we just provide monitoring, it's, you will just understand what has happened. But if you really want to turn it into a signal, we need to connect the dots across uh, the different data types and insights that we are building. So we need some form of machine learning and reasoning as part of the platform. Uh, it does contain a lot of forward-looking indicators, so it's about systematically mining it. So we need to, an ability to run predictive algorithms on top of the platform. 
And of course, it's a, it's a very, very large data. We have more than 1.3 trillion documents in our corpus, and we are adding like around 700 million documents every day. It is a very large data, and we need uh, our, our, our compute and storage needs to be distributed. Over the time, uh, through the challenges that we have faced, we assembled uh, a scientific advisory board who excel in the areas of web data extraction, knowledge graph processing, NLP and information extraction, domain adaptation, and information network analysis. Uh, they have really helped us in uh, understanding what is the right way to define several interfaces for the platform for our machine learning engineers to be more effective, not just internally, but also external people who use our platform. So today, I'm going to mostly talk about fair hair AI. That's what we refer to as, as the our underlying platform that powers all the products across all the buying centers that you have seen. And it's a, it's a complete data platform with a lot of AI models in it and a lot of tooling for data scientists to uh, really accelerate in terms of insights creation. It's pretty powerful. You know, it's really powering uh, more than 30,000 business customers who's using it. And uh, it is arranged into a lot of data, enrichment services, and insight services. And at the heart of everything is Knowledge Graph, which is essentially what uh, I'm going to cover uh, in most of this talk. So what is a Knowledge Graph, right? I mean, if you just Google for Knowledge Graph, there are so many definitions, because it's a very loosely used term. Uh, you know, you have ontologies, you have knowledge bases, you have knowledge graphs. I mean, Google sort of refers to Knowledge Graph as their underlying uh, common sense factual knowledge that uh, really powers their search engine. Some people refer to knowledge graphs as large network of entities with semantic types and properties. Some people say knowledge graph is mainly to describe uh, real world entities uh, organized as form of a graph. And this is like a survey that was uh, done uh, by some university because this concept of knowledge graph is uh, coming up again and again. But I would like to first explain what we define as knowledge graph as part of our platform so that it sets a, a right precedence through the rest of the talk. So yeah, let's just say we have a lot of different data that we bring in, right? We get company websites, all the news blogs, press releases, forums, all the social data from all the fire hoses, job postings, public filings. And we have a lot more. Uh, I just want to show an example. So we index all the data around key entities. And for us, key entities are organizations, people, products, brands, right? So those are the key entities that we essentially structure all our data. We extract entities, attributes, relationships, events, trends, some bare minimum analytics that gives us uh, some basic understanding of what's happening around the, these entities and predictions over time. And we also connect them so that we have an easy way to start reasoning around uh, the analytics that we are building on top of the platform. So we have a ton of uh, tools and services uh, that helps us discover, connect, understand, and uh, deliver the insights that are, being, uh, that, are, that, are, that are being driven from a lot of data types that we have. Uh, one might ask, what's the importance of organizing as a knowledge graph? Why can't you just put all of this inside a massive search engine and call it the day? Uh, which we did for a long time. You know, we, we were running, I believe, like fourth or fifth biggest elastic search cluster in the world, indexing 1.2 trillion documents. But it was considerably getting harder when we want to provide more than vanilla analytics. If you really want to start uh, reasoning the insights, if you want to start doing causality correlations, right? really trying to explain uh, why an uh, event has occurred and how it is uh, relevant to the workflows that they have done, we need to start having reasoning capabilities. Right? So initially, we started with just you know, trying to focus on indexing a lot of data. And over the time, we started uh, trying to get a semantic understanding of how the data is organized. And uh, because of that, you know, we have a lot of uh, interesting uh, applications of, or layers that are built in the platform now like recommendation engines, uh, contextual uh, searches, semantic searches, inference engines, and that has really helped the APIs on top of the platform for the applications to be more uh, intelligent. And this is essentially how the entire fair AI is, uh, uh, the, the underlying thesis is. It covers the whole AI lifecycle and is completely centered around the knowledge graph. 
But the particular thing is we are not an open domain knowledge graph like how Google defines it. We are around a closed domain around companies and its related entities. So this is essentially different parts. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over each of them through the rest of the presentation. It starts with a lot of outside data uh, and the, our investments in uh, trying to do web data extraction on, uh, on more than 10 million sources. I'm going to cover about our NLP stack. Everything gets dumped into our data platform, and we create a knowledge graph. And we have uh, layers for doing graph embedding, graph aggregation, graph convolution, and uh, reasoning engines. Right. And this hybrid inference is essentially where we are uh, generating a lot of insights uh, from the underlying data. Uh, so the, the platform is not only used by all of our products, but it's also heavily used uh, at top universities. Uh, currently, these are the active uh, projects that are going on across uh, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and Oxford, who are building uh, uh, pretty long-term you know, like four to five year long term projects uh, on top of the platform. My favorite ones are question answering, graph rule mining, entity resolution, and the fake news detection is one of the social cause kind of a European Union funded project where they're trying to understand how to detect uh, the fact of a news, not just based on what's being reported, but based on uh, how it is connected to the rest of the facts that are being uh, generated from other news that are out there. And these partnerships have really helped us in uh, understanding what are the right interfaces for us to build the platform over time through different layers. All right. So let me first start with the data. You know, we are, in a way, uh, world's largest corpus of uh, outside data around the entities that we care about. Uh, as at this point, I think at the, the minute, we have like more than 1.3 trillion documents from uh, millions of sources spanning 80 different languages. And we have data of three types. Uh, one is comp licensed and compliant data. These are like Twitter fire hoses, right, which are not generally available for you to scrape from the internet, but something that we get through partnerships. We have hundreds of partnerships that are delivering data to us to be analyzed. Uh, then we have the data from open web, which is where we use uh, some AI technologies to really automate uh, the induction of the wrappers, which I'm going to go over. And the third is companies also push their own data to augment the external data to derive insights around their company. When we talk about uh, data from open web, right, and when we want to capture knowledge and information, there are different places where we can get data from. You know, we can do web data extraction from DOMs, mostly from templated websites. Uh, from annotations, these are site microdata that are uh, filled by humans. We have a lot of web tables where there is a lot of interesting information. And from all the text that we capture, we can do information extraction to, uh, to, to, to get some interesting knowledge. I'm going to first talk about the web data extraction. And this is typically what I call as academic web, right? Uh, the typical comments that you hear are, hey, we have a lot of microdata. We have semantic web that has solved this problem. We don't need any intelligent scrapers. Most of the data is nicely programmatically available, right? So I have like a nice templated website with a pretty house here. But in real world, it's, it's really bad. You know, the APIs are very limited to large websites. And web tables and microdata is very marginal in terms of the information, new information that you can find. And the real problem is not in terms of the one-time extraction, but keeping the data up to date. So the, the, the so-called knowledge graph that I, I spoke about, it's, it's temporal in nature. It's the difference in the information sets that we get is essentially what gives us the insights. I mean, the static snapshot is more like a question answering engine to get a sense of what's happening now. But re to really understand what has changed over time, you need this temporality aspect. And that's essentially where we find key uh, or, 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 or key sort of uh, predictive signals that we can uh, come up with. So for us, uh, continuous extraction is, uh, is, uh, is not just a requirement, but it's very much necessary for us for most of our insights. And traditional scraping, right? Uh, I guess you guys know this. Usually, you write code wrappers for, for sources. These are like XPath expressions that basically tells you, you know, what part of the website uh, is uh, what particular field, right? Uh, at some point in the time, in the, in the past, we were basically writing uh, these XPath uh, code wrappers. We had more than 50 source engineers 
who are maintaining uh, these manual wrappers. But the problem is the sources were failing, uh, the cha they change all the time, and it really, it, it really gets unmanageable to manage the sources. And then we, of course, we also experimented with uh, visual uh, support tools so that you don't really have to, you don't really have to really code it up, but you can actually build visual tools to generate the wrappers. But the still the underlying problem is the sources change all the time. It's really hard to cap up. So the, the method that we went after is basically automatic generation, which is what we call as wrapper induction, to generate these wrappers that actually go out and uh, fetch a given uh, template website. But the problem is, you know, as I mentioned, initially we start with uh, news. That's mostly like a few hundred thousand news sources. Over the time when we added more and more data, data types, now we have more than 10 million sources. We really need to scale to the web in terms of uh, doing induction. But what we can afford is a bit of a prior knowledge about a given uh, site, right? For example, if you're trying to extract addresses from a corporate website, uh, from the knowledge graph, you essentially know for all the previous addresses that you have seen, how the address is laid out. Like, you know, you have the street number followed by street name followed by city in US. Whereas in the UK, it's probably you have the block number followed by the, uh, the actual code followed by the street. So there is a bit of a domain knowledge that you can actually capture based on the information that you know about entities already. And these are mostly expressed as uh, gazetteers or rules. And, uh, and also we want to generate, and we can't generate a wrapper from ground up all the time, right? So what we did was uh, we built a framework for rule-based feature engineering that essentially supports quick turnaround time and it captures some domain-specific rich features, right? And these features are representing the structure of the site, the visual rendering, textual content, link structure, interface patterns. So you have a base library of uh, 2,500 features that we have uh, built. And for each of the domain, you need a special customization uh, in order to tweak it uh, for, a, for, a, for, a, uh, for, a, for a new area. And of course, we do continuous exploration, form understanding and filling, record attribution, and induction before we go actually go into the extraction of the web page. Uh, this has been a, a long work. Uh, we started in early 2010s, and we published over all the different components that essentially go into most of the web data extraction conferences, right? There's a solid work. Uh, that took us a long time to, to, to get to the place where we can automatically apply uh, wrappers now. And the effects are, you know, we, we spend 90% less human, uh, human effort in maintaining most of our external fetching systems. And we are able to extract a lot more attributes than before, simply because these are programmatically configured uh, rather than a human configuring those. And we exported our sources from almost 300,000 new sources to 10 million sources in a span of uh, two years. And to get from zero to 300, it took us uh, almost 15 years. So in the new frontier, uh, we are doing now so-called browserless extraction. So we spoke about how we are generating these wrappers, but these wrappers are still for visual wrappers so that you, you fire up a browser and you execute the wrapper. The problem is some sites uh, actually produce so much content, especially Chinese sources, we are not able to keep up with uh, Keeping, the late, keeping our SLAs in our system. So now we started exploring what called HTTP API wrappers, where we essentially try to understand. Uh, uh, so the way it was started was, we started actually doing JSON crawling, which is just looking at the backend APIs, what the website is calling, and trying to replicate the, the program. Right? So this is not like a visual wrapper. You write those programs. And these programs are something that humans, like regular source engineers cannot write. It requires like software engineering, engineering to write it. So we started looking at, uh, okay, can we look at how the browser is rendering, the calls it's making, looking at the trace graph, and trying to understand what are the underlying API calls it's making that we can fetch the data automatically, right? Uh, we made some good strides in that. We published a paper in the WWF conference this year. Uh, and, uh, there is a, and what we have seen is between the OX path, that's our language for X path, and the HTTP wrappers, you can see that for a variety of data sets where we benchmarked, uh, we see that uh, the number of interactions that are needed to get the full content has substantially reduced, like 19 interactions to 
one and a half interactions because you are essentially fishing for the underlying API call. Uh, very promising, um, but I want to say that this is not fully production yet. This is the next frontier on where we are going after. And of course, we also do a lots of uh, fetching from fire hoses. As I said, uh, you know, more in that 700 million, more than half of it comes from uh, fire hoses of data, right? Through different partnerships that we have, and uh, we built our own uh, sort of ingestion uh, data mapping language so that uh, it's uh, really easy to onboard the sources. And this language is actually, you, you don't have to be a programmer to write the mapping language into our system. Uh, we open source, and it's also very heavily used in a lot of other companies. Uh, it's mostly to do like simple ETLs and uh, convert from one format to another. Right? And we also wrote a lot of tooling around multiplexing across different queues. And uh, this is so that we can bridge various data processing queues that happen over time. And we support uh, a lot of data sources in terms of sources and sinks. In fact, this was so heavily used that at some point we were actually trending. So this was our key engineer who wrote, the, who wrote this tool, Benthos. And uh, for a long time, we were actually like the second most popular uh, Git repository uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the trending. Just quite cool to see a lot of uh, outside adaption on uh, a very simple problem of if I have something like two different queues. I have Kafka and I have Rabbit, and I need to shovel the data from one to another, right? And it turns out when you actually try to do a lot of data integration, you have to integrate with lots of uh, queues. So it's a pretty dumb multiplexer, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, people started using a lot, which we are very proud of. So after the data, you know, that's essentially how we do web data extraction. And we built a lot of proprietary enrichment services for all the textual data that we bring in. right? And the goal is uh, we want to bring the data very close to the models. right? Before the explosion of some of these deep pre-trained models, we had to build models that are very specific to news, very specific to tweets, very specific to reviews, because they come in different shapes. We were doing a lot of domain adaptation and in order to scale across the zero types and languages. So typically what we try to do is you know, we do entity recognition right, and resolution, event extraction, relation extraction, sentiment over, especially if it is things like news, reviews, uh, uh, social documents, uh, a lot of topic categorization, right, uh, resolution of links. I'm going to go over some of this uh, methods where we especially, especially toyed and uh, productionized some of the neural architectures using recently. So these essentially are, are sort of uh, different NLP tasks that we do in our company. And we did a benchmark across different providers that are out there, uh, both in terms of the cloud providers and also like on-prem providers, right? The, one of the main reasons we built our own is there is no one, uh, no one uh, partner that is fully comprehensive in terms of what we need, both in terms of language coverage and the type of tasks that we want to go after. We want to keep the costs in control, of course. And the biggest thing is it was really hard to customize the models uh, when we're relying on most of the external partners, right? So these are like pre-trained models, but it's really hard to do adaptation based on that because you don't you cannot really introspect into those uh, we are scaling all these enrichments to almost 700 million documents on a daily basis so some so at some points uh, we actually took some trade offs in terms of the quality of the model to the performance but at the same time you also have the deeper models if you want to apply this on uh, uh, on a subset stream of uh, data that's flowing through our platform so few of the <clears throat> So a few of the NLP enrichments that I would like to go after in today's talk are uh, like the entity recognition, resolution, and the relation extraction, right? Like for example, this is mainly to populate our knowledge graph facts. Uh, the entity recognition is so that whenever we see a piece of text, we can uh, essentially recognize the spans of the text that are entities of interest to us. So we mainly go after organization, products, people's brand, right? The, co the task of NED, which is named entity disambiguation, is to resolve the surface form that we, that we got as an entity to our underlying knowledge graph. For example, if you say Tesla, but the Tesla can be Tesla Science Center, Tesla Inc., or a Czechoslovakian company called Tesla. We need to understand which Tesla this particular Tesla belongs to, right? 
And the last one is we do relation extraction, right? This is, uh, in this case, we want to have an edge in our graph or a fact in our graph that says that Tesla has acquired Solar City, right? Or ha has announced full acquisition of Solar City. So that required as relation extraction. In terms of the NER architecture, we do, uh, we have two models. One is based on uh, the, tip, uh, the traditional CRF models, where we use uh, uh, the basics like the post tags, uh, brown clusters, noun chunks, and throw it into a CRF model. Uh, we were actually doing quite good in terms of the F1, right? And then we started experimenting with uh, character level embeddings. So we, 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 we embed, uh, we do like word level vectors and the character embedding, send it through a bi-directional LSTM, and then we apply a CRF on top of it. So even though we didn't really see a lot of improvement of a CRF versus LSTM, CN, and CRF, the place where it was useful to support still this neural network architecture models is for domain adaptation, right? In case of the traditional CRF, if you want to move from one language to another or to move from news to a social document, it needed a ground up re or a gr ground up building of the model. Whereas in most of this uh, word and character level embeddings, uh, we are able to train some of, retrain some of the higher layer layer uh, higher network layers. And we saw some uh, interesting, uh, we are able to at least bootstrap the models with, uh, uh, with acceptable uh, F1 scores in other languages and data types very easily. Right. When it comes to disambiguation, what we do is we represent our uh, knowledge graph in a DBpedia-like schema, which is extended. And it gets converted into a, a Lucene index. right? And we use an algorithm called Egdestis which is essentially like a page rank walk on the, on the graph. And uh, when you see the surface form, right, like the entities that you see in a text, what we do is we get candidates from the graph, underlying graph, and then look at other entities that are existing and other terms that are existing, and use that as uh, contextual features to sort of do a graph walk to get the actual, uh, to, to do probability assignment of what entity that particular surface form is talking about, right? So in that example, the entities like Tesla, Solar City, right, they get resolved to uh, the Tesla Inc. and the Solar City Inc. inside our graph. You know, we have more than, but the, but the problem here, we started seeing some problems here for bigger companies where there is a lot of information about it, right, or a lot of entities, known entities that are associated with it, it's easier to do resolving, like things like Tesla, it's probably easier simply because there's a lot of information about Tesla that you can mine a lot of known structured entities, like you know, maybe Elon Musk or uh, uh, or the batteries, right? There are a lot of pre-existing DBpedia concepts or Wikipedia concepts around Tesla. But if you look at uh, long-tail companies, there is not much structural information that we can find about them. So uh, just way, by using uh, who the founders are or what their product does, it's not enough sufficient information to resolve those entities uh, from the documents. So what we did was, uh, we essentially built uh, like a term miner, right? That essentially mines for, for discriminative terms based on all the occurrences of the, of the smaller companies in any of the data types that we have seen and trying to sort of populate the graph with these contextual words that are necessary to do the walk. So in a way, we are trying to populate the graph with uh, a lot of significant discriminative terms which might or might not be entities, right? But still help us in uh, resolving uh, smaller companies. And but the problem is most of the most of this work has been done only on English so far. And since we rely on the underlying uh, DBpedia indexes, uh, we can actually go from one language to another by doing the walks across those language uh, bindings, right? Or the index uh, bindings that we have. Uh, next is the relation extraction. Again, the task is here to predict the class of a semantic relation between pairs of entities that we see in a text. Uh, we, did, uh, we did work around uh, trying to, you know, using word embeddings, uh, positional embeddings. We saw some interesting results uh, around, uh, around certain relation types. Like, for example, uh, yeah. So this is actually the network architecture. So we use attention-based by LSTM 
uh, it's a re-implementation of a paper that was published, but it's just we productionized it and applied it at a very, very large scale. Uh, the, good, the thing to note here is these are these are fence scores that are noted. Like some of them are really bad, right? Like 0 0.37, 0 0.65. That's mostly because of uh, unavailability of enough amount of training data with the labels that says that okay, this document is uh, uh, expressing this relation. But luckily, given that we don't look at a date, the document in isolation, we try to actually look at the facts derived from a lot of documents to start getting the real confidences uh, in the graph. So we even even though even though so the the the, the thing is per document uh, NLP extraction can only take you a take you a, take you a certain way. We also do a lot of event extraction in the interest of the time. I'm going to skip it, but these are things like acquisitions, product launches, right? We have a large ontology of hundreds of event types that we we extract, uh, we, 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 which is mostly we use. Uh, uh, like writing rules, like semantic rules, on top of the NLP tasks output. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over our deeper sentiment model, right? We do something called as a, a character level uh, sentiment analysis, where we can actually see over the time how the sentiment has uh, sentiment is beha behaved within a text, and then we overlay it with uh, entities and aspects. We, we have our own sort of uh, studio for creating a training data set that has adapters to, the, adapters to Google and uh, Amazon for building our own custom models. We have very sophisticated uh, pipeline infrastructure to run this NLP, uh, which supports, it supports things like uh, conditional forks and joints, uh, a, a way to actually dynamically score the models, goal set creations, and we built our uh, infrastructure hosted pipelines. This is something that our NLP developers can easily configure with a JSON, where they can talk, where they can essentially configure pipelines uh, and deploy it in production uh, with, the, with, the, with the simple JSON file, which is really interesting because we don't, like most of the data scientists, uh, the, they, they would like to spend more time on the building of the models and less on the infrastructure plumbing that is needed. So the more you faster enable this, the better it is. Uh, in the new frontiers of NLP, uh, we did a lot of work by using the shallow pre-training models like Vertovex and Gloves. Uh, we are excited to see that there has been uh, a lot more deeper pre-trained models that not only uh, that can actually capture the meaning of the word, the syntax and the semantics of the word, like Elmo, ULM Fit, OpenAI, Transformers, the recent release Google Bird. These are like real. I mean, I call it like the ImageNet era for NLP. Right? This is really helping us in. Uh, uh, in, 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 in actually replacing the lower level embeddings and, re and representing higher level features for most common NLP tasks. So there's a lot that we can uh, do with it. So out of all the sources that we get when we get from web and when we get from text, right, uh, we get several sources of knowledge and we need to assemble this into a graph. Uh, typical problems are when we get objects from uh, multiple sources, how do we know whether they're referring to the same real world uh, entities? Uh, for example, in one so source, it might say it's Intel. In the other source, it says Intel Corporation. And third might say Intel Corp, right? So our record linking workflow, it's a, yeah, it's a usual technique. We use group uh, agglomerative clustering to actually improve the thresholds. We also do truth discovery. This is so that we can actually aggregate on the conflicting data sources. Like if I give you a table, how would you say uh, where does uh, Spotify belong, right? The simple thing is you can do majority voting, but the problem is what happens if you have ties and how do you trust a source reliability? So what we do is we iteratively compute the truth of the fact that is, uh, that is derived from a source and based on the facts and also compute the reputation of the source and you recursively go over the graph all the time to start assigning confidences. Uh, finally, when you assemble all the graphs, like how do you enforce ontological rules? Uh, for that, we have a paper in ICD called Rule Mining, where we try to understand what are the most common uh, patterns of uh, rules that violate the rest of the ontology. Right? It goes through human feedback, but this is essentially how we keep the how we how we keep the knowledge graph clean. Uh, we can't talk about text analytics without talking about the the search and the backend. Uh, we have uh, we invest a lot in Elasticsearch over time. This is mainly used for our serving layer. And then we have a ton of other additional inferences to do reasoning, convolution, hybrid inference, 
rule binding, right? Uh, yeah, I can skip this. We did a lot of work in trying to run the fourth biggest Elasticsearch cluster to make sure that we do optimal shard placement and query routing. We have some interesting blog posts on that who are, in, who are uh, curious. We can skip this. We can, yeah, most of this work done has been published. Uh, that's, some, that's something can be referred. Yeah, in the interest of time, I, I, I had to accelerate the last uh, several slides, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, either here or in the office hours later. Thank you.